Good morning, everyone. It's uh, the final day of the Geneva Health Forum, and it's great to see you here. Um, the rain has finally caught up with us, so thank you to everyone who had to walk through the rain to get here. And I hope you're all nice, uh, warm and toasty in here. I had, have had your morning coffee and are ready for the first high-level discussion for the day which is going to be focused on planetary health in the pandemic era, a humanitarian perspective and priorities for action. So we're essentially digging into this interaction between humans, animals and the environment, something that we have been discussing over the past three days at length. And of course, we can't fit everything into 60 minutes, but I have an expert panel here who will try to do all that. And I'd first like to welcome Monica Rui from Doctors Without Borders, MSF. She can take her place here. Welcome to the stage. Next up, we have Sonia Roshnik from Healthcare Without Harm. Following that, we have Catherine Loon Grayson from ICRC. And actually, we do have another speaker who will be joining us via video, not live, but he will give his comments. And it's Chris Golden from the Harvard School of Public Health. And to moderate this discussion, I'd of course like to welcome Stephen Cornish, also from MSF, Doctors Without Borders. Thank you so much for leading this discussion. Uh, housekeeping rules, we have 60 minutes for everyone. We do have some time for Q&A, so keep some questions at the back of your mind. Um, five minutes towards the end, we'll come up and try to go through closing remarks or if we have time for one more Q&A. And I have been told that there have been some audio uh, issues. Maybe it's clearer to listen if you pick up the headphones in front of you. Um, maybe that would be better if you find that some of the speakers are not as loud as you wish. So uh, with that in mind, I'll let you kick off the discussion. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it's great to see you all here this morning. I'd also uh, like to thank Ashuji and Dr. Eric Comte for all of the organization. Uh, it's really wonderful to see, and thrilled that we're here to discuss uh, planetary health and its interactions on the work that we all do. Uh, at the organization I represent, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, we are convinced that by adding a planetary health lens to our mission and our program analysis, that we can not only help reduce suffering, impact on disease burden, but that we'll better serve the populations in distress and our patients around the world. And we know this because through the pandemic and through other interactions with our patients and communities, uh, they've been telling us now for years that the changing climate has been impacting everything from nutrition to disease burden to their very ability uh, to have livelihoods and better life. We're also convinced that uh, if we take this uh, approach, that we'll be able to make our project structures and our hospitals more climate proof, uh, that by working together in partnership with others, such as with Health and Harmony, we'll be able to strengthen community resiliency. Uh, we could lower uh, the negative environmental impacts that we are all having uh, through partnerships, for example, uh, with Geneva's own Climate Accelerator. And I won't lie to you, it is early days yet, uh, but the first steps are the hardest. And we have decided to be bold uh, and to really reach for the top. We've signed up to lower our carbon footprint by half by 2030. We've started organizational change uh, through climate education and literacy at field level. But also and importantly, I think we all have a role to tell the story. And uh, we've now uh, started to convert the, the stories we're hearing from the field in order to do advocacy and communication with our, our donors and our supporters, six million of which are around the world. Inside the organization, we've used different types of methodologies from ThinkUp to ensure that we get ideas from our field teams to also using our MSF Innovation Fund to trial and test new solutions for the field, from solar oxygen to solar uh, generators, uh, powering up, reducing waste, uh, looking at how to reduce single-use plastic. Uh, one initiative, uh, we have figured out that we use six million little drug distribution bags every year. They're used once and thrown away, and we're now looking at alternatives through either paper or seaweed and other types of products that we might be able to use instead. And we're looking, of course, and this panel is on it, on changing the disease burden itself. By looking at weather forecasting, uh, trend analysis, we're able to now predict malaria peaks up to four months in advance, and that allows us to use mass drug administration, vector control, and other initiatives at community level to be able to reduce the disease burden and the severity before it even happens. We've also changed how we work by working with community practitioners and through the help of an e-care algorithm, it walks these community health workers through uh, diagnostic and treatment of things like malaria and um, malnutrition, which avoids families from spending money and time on the road, 
reduces the disease burden, and helps communities be more resilient. And then they only need to do referrals to more centralized structures uh, once they really have a severe case. We, of course, are here uh, to share, to learn, and to advance together collectively. As we overwhelmingly, collectively, all of us in this room, uh, bear the responsibility for this climate crisis, we also, of course, then have a moral obligation to be part of the solution. And I'm so thrilled to see so many doctors and, and medical students in the room. At MSF, we remain a medical organization first and foremost, and our job number one is to save lives. But we increasingly have to live up to the do no harm principle. And this includes to ensure that we're not jeopardizing people's lives and livelihoods tomorrow. <clears throat> With that, I really want to turn quickly now to our panel because we have a star-studded panel uh, and these are the folks that are doing the work on the ground and the ones who are going to learn the most from. And uh, before getting into that, though, I'd like to queue up uh, a video that will just give you a little bit of a snapshot of what it's like uh, in uh, some of the countries where we're working now. And this one is from Niger. C'est très alarmant ce que... Normalement, nous ici, on vit à base... Here, we... Pas aux besoins de la communauté. Moi, ma préoccupation, c'est que si rien n'est fait présentement, je ne souhaiterais pas que mes parents aussi puissent euh, se développer à Magréa. Je suis en train de viser d'autres alternatives pour pouvoir évoluer avec mes enfants ailleurs, euh, parce que ici, ce n'est pas la joie. se font très rares et aussi les pluies demeurent inégalement réparties au lieu qu'elles soient bien réparties dans le temps. Maintenant c'est concentré en un mois par exemple le mois d'août on récolte plus de pluie. Et tu vois la plupart sont pareils. Là, bon. La terre ne donnait plus parce qu'on l'a surchargée et aussi il n'y avait pas des apports nécessaires pour faire produire ces champs là. Donc avant, quand on cultivait, c'est pour une année et même plus. Maintenant, c'est juste pour six mois. Et après les trois mois là de la période de soudure, ça c'est difficilement qu'on arrive à couvrir cette période. demeure jusqu'à présent la pathologie dominante et qui tue la plus grande partie de la population depuis des années. Quand il pleut, il y a beaucoup de moustiques qui se développent et qui attaquent la population. Pendant cette période de 3-4 mois de pluie, on est vraiment affecté par des cas de palus graves. développer une approche qui permet de sensibiliser les parents sur la précocité de la prise en charge. C'est vraiment une approche qui a beaucoup soulagé les parents qui trouvent sur place la prise en charge au lieu de faire des kilomètres.
Excellent. So with that, that sets the scene of what we're dealing with on the ground. And I'd love to turn now to Catherine Lund with our first question. And I'd like to know from you, uh, what climate and environmental related impacts are you seeing in your work and how does that affect the activities that ICRC is conducting? Thank you so much. Um, I think I'd start by saying that what we're seeing reflects a lot of what you've had in this um, short film. I'd start by stressing that we're all aware that climate change is impacting all of us, everyone around the globe, but we see that the most dire impacts are on the world's most vulnerable communities. The ICRC works with communities that are enduring conflict or violence, and they are among those world's most vulnerable communities. The way we've looked at climate and the environment for a long time in the organization was the, through the prism of international humanitarian law and how it protects the environment. In recent years, we've come to recognize that we also had to understand how climate and environmental risks materialize in the lives of the community we work with if we wanted to be developing adequate responses. And this has led to some research work in a number of countries to try to better understand what are these impacts and what should we be doing about these. Now, if I simplify, we see impacts on all dimensions of people's lives, from their health, as you were pointing out, to their physical safety, to their access to water, food, to their economic security. So we basically see impacts on all these dimensions, and we also see that these impacts are interconnected. If people's livelihoods are affected, this will limit their access to food. In a number of cases, this will limit their access to health services, for instance. So you end up with interconnected impacts that are amplifying one another. The other thing that we see and that is important to bear in mind is that these impacts are also connected to the environment in which people live. And these dimensions need to be looked into when I'm sure we will turn to the, to the response just after, but we need to take that into account when we're looking at the type of responses that we need to be um, developing. The other element we see is that a number of consequences are far-reaching. They go across borders. So think of mobility patterns, for instance. Think of access to resources where you see influence on a continental scale if you're over-exploiting water or you have a scarcity of water in country X, this is very likely to influence access to water downstream. And that needs to be taken into account as well when we think of um, responses. One thing to consider is the fact that climate change is often not the source of people's problem. It's an amplifier of existing problems in a number of cases. I mean, take let's go back to water, take Iraq and access to water in Iraq. You have existing problems in Iraq relating to environmental degradation, to the management of resources, to dams that are, are being put up in countries upstream, and so on and so forth. Now what we see is an amplification of problems related to access to water because of climate change. Um, I think I'd like to speak to one question that we are being regularly asked as the ICRC, and that is, is climate change causing more conflict? The short answer to this question is no. Climate change is not causing conflict. Think of Japan, Australia, a number of countries that are extremely climate exposed and are, I think we'd all agree, peaceful. What we see is that climate change, as I was pointing out earlier, is significantly exacerbating vulnerabilities in countries that are where communities are already vulnerable because these are countries where people often have a very limited adaptive capacity. Why is it that people have a very limited adaptive capacity? If I look at countries in conflict, a conflict will obviously cause deaths and injuries, but it also disrupts the foundation of societies. It will harm social cohesion, it will harm and weaken institutions and governance, it will harm the economy, it will harm li livelihoods, and so on and so forth. This means, and then the conflicts usually affect the environment as well on which people rely to survive. So we end up in a situation where people's capacity to adapt to shocks or react to shocks is extremely limited. And this is where we see a clear intersection between climate and conflict. Now, I've started by saying climate change does not cause conflict. I'll add a nuance to this. What we see in places where we work is that in the absence of authorities able to manage tensions, 
to manage an equitable access to resources, climate change can exacerbate tensions and lead to tensions at a very local level. And that we saw in all the research work that we did. So we often see exacerbated intercommunal tensions around access to resources, around access to land, or between herders and farmers around transhumance patterns, for instance. Again, this is happening in places where institutions are already weak. And again, we're not speaking of large-scale conflict, we're usually speaking of localized intercommunal violence. The last thing I'd like to point out is the, the mental health impact, because I'm surrounded by health experts. In the research work that we did, one thing that was really quite striking is we think climate change, we think livelihoods, we think loss of assets, loss of sources of incomes, health problems, but physical health problems in a number of cases. One thing that people were consistently pointing out is how they felt that it was their environment was changing in a way that was challenging their identity because livelihoods are not only a source of income. They're also the way people see their place in the world. So we, we heard a lot of people speaking of how they felt disorientated, how they felt lost in the face of changing weather patterns and with the fact that they could no longer read the weather. And to us, this was probably one of the most puzzling element because we're not quite sure how to address this, but we're, we're quite sure that there's quite a profound element in also understanding that people define themselves as part of their environment and it connects very much to their mental health and their identity. So in short, if I can sum this up, we see impacts at all levels. I assume you've understood that. Um, and all levels being people, communities, systems, ecosystems, and this challenges the way we work. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for pointing out this uh, link, not only the physical link, but also what you've described at the end is, is climate grief, which I think we're more familiar with perhaps uh, with our young people and here, but perhaps not giving it the words to the communities that we're working with who see their livelihoods disappearing. And I think we saw a little bit of that on the film uh, of that coming through. You know, if you have to upend your whole life and change everything, uh, then it's going to affect your culture. It affects your future. It affects everything. Uh, turning now uh, to Sonia, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your approach uh, overlapping various data sets and uh, what do you do to better understand the climate and environmental risks that we're facing? Thank you very much. So, yeah, I would say that there's, there's sort of five big elements that are worth understanding. One is estimating the impact that you have on the environment because when we see these impacts, we know that we all have a responsibility to somehow reduce them. And that might be um, on, on the carbon footprint or the climate impact level. And if we know that the health sector globally is contributing 4.4%, that's similar to a large country, it's, it's really significant. But there's also other aspects like the water footprint or toxicity and the waste footprints. Um, I know the Dutch Ministry of Health has um, you know, done actually a, a footprint a lot across all those elements and what's interesting is that a significant part of all of those footprints lies in, med in, the, way in the medicines that are used. So that's very specific to us in healthcare um, and we have a, a specific responsibility to understand the impacts of what's specific to healthcare as well as the overall. Um, I think the other aspect is understanding the levels of pollution in water um, through the, the, the things we do be that might be with incinerators. I know in Nepal they've been trying to reduce the use of incinerators because they're not necessary to deal with medical waste. You can use autoclaves and biodigesters as an alternative and save an awful lot of um, impacts. But the other one is the climate risks and vulnerabilities, which we've just understood. And what are the community's risks? And, and that's uh, geographical in terms of flooding, heat waves, but then also how that intersects with communities. And I don't know if any of you were at the film that was here last night, that was incredibly well illustrated, the interconnection between the two. And I think we need to understand the health impacts, how this increases the burden of disease um, from pollution, from premature deaths, um, all the mental health impacts as well. And for me, the reason for understanding that really well is because you can turn it on its head and know that actually you need to not just look at the risks, but look at the opportunities. So my fifth one is that really you need to start looking at the opportunities in reducing the impacts and improving health. And that's from an economic, a social and an environmental perspective. 
And in fact, it's that scale of opportunity that gets me up in the morning. It's not, otherwise I feel a bit weighed down by everything. Um, so, you know, if you think of a health system or a hospital or a clinic or an organization, you know, like MSF, who understands the business case of installing renewable energy and the health be benefits of a re or truly resilient communities and the environmental benefits of a biodiversity in and around the facilities, I mean, then you can really bring your staff, patients, communities on the journey with you. And it's such an important journey. So I'd like to say not just risks, but also opportunities, because that helps drive a lot of action. And I think if you think of it from an opportunities perspective, it helps address some of the mental stress that a lot of us feel um, through the climate crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sonia. You've lifted me up just listening to some of these possibilities. And I think it is so important um, coming back to the earlier discussion on, on mental health, sometimes these discussions can get overwhelming and we see all the problems and we really have to also focus on the solutions. So thank you for bringing some of the solutions to the table. We're going to turn now to Chris Golden, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but he did send us his answers via video and we'll watch them on the screen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. My name is Chris Golden, and I'm an assistant professor of nutrition and planetary health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I've been asked to speak about harvesting data science to better understand the climate and environmental risks to human health. I want to provide a concrete example of how our team is doing this and how we're positioned to make an unprecedented advance for public health through the creation of multi-sector information systems that can yield critical insights about how best to protect people, and especially the most vulnerable, from the existential threat of climate change. Public health surveillance has typically not woven informative climate, environmental, or agricultural data into their platforms. This absence has prevented an understanding of their health impacts and has stalled our ability to better, to better predict harms before they occur. To develop public health systems with the sophistication and rigor commensurate with the threat from climate change that we face, we began a collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health in Madagascar to develop a climate smart health surveillance system. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge the minister, Professor Zeli Randramanantani, the head of epidemiological surveillance, Dr. Adolphe André Mizarasu, and the former secretary general, Dr. Erlene Ramiantani Arif. Without their vision and leadership, this project would have never taken off. In Madagascar, 78% of people live in poverty, 6% of children die before age five. Malnutrition stunts the growth of nearly half the population, and maternal mortality rates are amongst the highest in the world. These difficult public health problems must be considered in light of climate change and its associated droughts, floods, and heat, which can ravage food production and people alike. We anticipate that the continued rapid rise of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations and corresponding increases in radiative forcing will profoundly impact Earth's climate systems, communities, and health. From 1976 to 2011, Madagascar experienced at least 46 national disasters, floods, drought, and cyclones, affecting more than 11 million people and causing an estimated $1 billion US in damages. This climate smart health surveillance system that we're trying to develop will routinely and rigorously estimate and forecast the health impacts of climate change related exposures like extreme temperatures, severe storms, droughts, floods, wildfires, and air pollution to identify the populations and communities most vulnerable to adverse health effects. The information system will leverage nationally representative data and innovative data science methods to yield an unprecedented ability to pinpoint climate change exposures and figure out where health impacts are likely to occur and who will be most affected. The disparate climate, cultures, geography, economies, and much else across Madagascar provide, contra provide contrasts in climate change exposures and health outcomes that will allow our team to deeply interrogate how climate change impacts human health. In Madagascar, we have a data set harnessing records from ministerial databases of every one of the 3,545 health clinics throughout the nation with data reported over the last 15 years. These databases will be linked to a wealth of climate, environmental, and agricultural exposure data harnessed from remote sensing observatories to enable climate smart health surveillance. Specifically, 
we can interrogate relationships about deforestation and malaria transmission, forest cover and diarrheal disease, drought and crop failure and malnutrition, or cyclonic activity and severe anxiety. The more we can understand these planetary health relationships, the more we can predict them. Which brings me to the second question I was asked to answer. What can be done to enhance health system resilience to both climate change and future disaster and pandemics? To be focused and effective, public health systems must account for the full scope of concerns material to human welfare. In this century, climate change will become the most influential force in shaping humanity. To stem its potential harms, we must learn to better predict and manage the fallout from the disasters at insights. More sophisticated early warning systems could be deployed when certain high-risk forces coalesce in space and time. Madagascar's health ministry, instead of reacting to emergencies, will have instantaneous access to updated predictive information, and this could allow for methodical intervention and resource deployment. Civil servants will be able to catch emerging epidemics and halt disease in its tracks by sending out resources and medications to communities in need. Non-governmental organizations and government workers can use the system to inform interventions like food aid and efforts to curb malaria spread. Another organization leading the charge in this space is Health and Harmony, and I'm working with their team in Madagascar to collect fine-scale data from their impressive mobile clinic operation that will allow us to recognize conditions that may precipitate disease emergence. Interestingly, I think Madagascar is on the cutting edge of what may be possible with regard to climate smart public health. And I'm, and I'm hoping that the rest of the world will follow suit. Thank you so much for your time and please do get in touch if I can be helpful in supporting this in any way. Now I'd like to turn uh, to Sonia to address the second question uh, that we've just heard the answer from Chris on uh, around how can we en enhance health system resilience in front of climate change and other disasters and pandemics. Thank you very much. So I'm very much of the view that resilience is, um, you know, it's a lot about the preparedness and the planning that you can do ahead of everything. And of course, it's about recovery and building forward um, a bit, as I mentioned before. And I, I would just like to say that, you know, it, it is really important to look at what's going to be happening in the years to come and the decades to come, not just to look at what's happening now and what happened before. It's a bit like if you're driving a car and you're just looking at the rear view mirror you're, and you forget to look at the road ahead. And actually, some of looking at the road ahead and how much we need to take into account means that we have to transform what we're doing and rethink things. So for me, the, the main thing about resilience is about um, integrating in a, in a systemic response or a systemic approach, our approach to climate, extreme events, crisis, pandemics, they're all health crises. And actually, there are some uh, great opportunities to preempt and respond and, and build better. And so we know a lot of the win-win interventions already. I mean, in an ideal world, the health facility would be the last building standing to help provide care, to su support, and to do it in a green and accessible way that supports communities. So I'm a great advocate for we need to be looking at what green universal access to healthcare looks like. And that is a whole world in development. It's not about um, doing what we do now better. It's about taking that forward into a next phase. So... I mean, of course, we know all the things about um, clinics being resistant to typhoons, being powered by clean energy, harvesting rainwater. Um, but, you know, it's w what those uh, facilities can also provide for their communities. So having off-grid um, energy can really help with mobile charging. It can help with security, with operating at night. It can help with so many other things. And I, I would just like to bring two examples of where um, a health system has actually utilized the pandemic as an opportunity to build resilience further, just to demonstrate the point. So, I mean, in, um, in Colombia, there's a hospital that um, during the epidemic, when they saw all this need for PPE, they bought you know, washable anti-fluid chlorine resistant antimicrobial gowns. And it meant that they were able to reduce their gown purchases by 36,000 units per month reducing their waste by 3.6 tons um, and obviously the resulting CO2, but also saving $82,000 every month. So there was a way that you could get those win-win-wins. Um, another hospital also looked at how they could decontaminate their N95 masks so they could be reused and they saved lots of money and tons. And they didn't have the choice of 
um, using single-use items all the time. So there's something about designing for reuse, designing for new ways of doing things and transforming our systems. Another example comes from um, Malaysia and Taiwan where there's a Buddhist sushi hospitals who have a vegetarian food policy throughout um, their operations. But during the pandemic, they decided to use that as an opportunity to provide meals for the most vulnerable patients and their families. And they saw that as a way of reducing con person contact during the pandemic and to ease a financial burden for poorer communities and improve health. And they've now demonstrated that if you're on a vegetarian diet, you can actually improve your immunity to COVID. So, you know, there are multiple solutions that if we um, address them as a systemic, in a systemic way, we can build resilience um, throughout our services, our communities and our world, hopefully. Well, with that challenge thrown down, uh, <laughs> let me take the question then on future forecasting and a whole of operation approach uh, to the humanitarian sector and to find out from Kathleen Noon first, what can we do uh, to strengthen our response front of climate and environmental challenges? as organizations? So I'll start by not answering your question. I think there's a, there's a very, we need to keep in mind that a part of the response is mitigation, where we play a very small role, but we need to call as humanitarian actors for strong, ambitious mitigation measures to avoid the worst consequences, the worst humanitarian consequences of the climate crisis. Because there's something about adapting responses, which is extremely important and continues to be true even with extremely ambitious mitigation measures in the sense that these will not halt the climate crisis. Hopefully they will reduce it. So we have a responsibility in adapting responses to make sure that these are fit for purpose. But I think we also have a responsibility in highlighting what are the impacts for the communities we work with of the climate crisis and stressing that mitigation is critical and for the time being insufficient. So that wasn't really an answer to your question, but there's a strong mobilization element there that is important, I think. Now I'll focus on three dimensions in responding to your question. The adapting our programs question, I think we then need to speak of the collective effort that is required as well, and I'll come back to the mobilization question as well. So, Programs-wise, I think Sonia has highlighted a number of points that I'm not going to reiterate, but are extremely important. So the strengthening resilience of people ahead of shock, so the impacts are lessened, is absolutely critical. And for humanitarian actors, this is quite a shift in mindset. We're quite used to responding to an emergency after the shock has hit. Now, I think there's a common agreement among most humanitarian organizations that we need to become much better at reducing risks at a systemic level and then addressing residual risks before a shock hits. But I, there's still a lot of work to do for this to happen. So I think we have a theoretical understanding of this for the time being, but we can strengthen that part of the response. And that requires that we better understand what are short-term risks, but what are also longer-term risks and trends, because that needs to be integrated into the thinking when we develop our um, programs. With regards to reducing risks, we also need, so I'm coming back to the international humanitarian law question, we also need to promote respect for the rules of international humanitarian law as these protect the environment. And it's important to protect the environment because that's what people rely on to survive. So this is part of reducing risks for communities we work with as well. Now you've alluded to that in speaking of the resilience of health um, clinics. We need to make sure that our own operations are, resist, are resilient to extreme weather events because in a number of instances, we might not be able to operate if we don't make sure that we are able to face those risks at the, an operational level. Now, on the collective nature of the response, I do want to stress that given the scale of the crisis, we need to embrace the fact that it requires a response that is collective bringing humanitarian actors together, but also working with a number of other actors. This is slightly uncomfortable for a number of us to recognize that this collective response is absolutely critical. I'm not going to say that we need to do everything jointly, but we need to make sure that there is complementarity between humanitarian development, climate efforts, and so on and so forth, because otherwise our responses will, be, will not be adequate to meet the needs of communities. And there I'd like to stress the work that we've been doing with the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent, where we work together 
with the whole of the, of the humanitarian system to develop a climate and environment charter for humanitarian organizations that was opened for signature a year ago. The idea behind the charter was very much to agree at a high level on common ambitions in responding to the climate and environment crisis. We were very pleased to see MSF sign it recently, and it was joining over 230 humanitarian organizations that have signed it. And to us, this is symbolically important in sending a message that is we recognize that we will need to work together to develop adequate responses to the climate crisis. The last point I wanted to make connects with the mobilization point that I was making earlier. It is very clear that as humanitarian actors, we need to use our voices to mobilize others to develop adequate responses. So there's the mitigation element, but there's also the adaptation element. Others being governments, development bodies, the private sector, big financing bodies. What we see for now is we have an extreme vulnerability to climate risks in countries in crisis. These also happen to be the places where the response in terms of climate action is the weakest because these are challenging environments to work in. We need to reverse that trend, otherwise we end up with populations that are completely left out when it comes to helping them adapt to what is a very challenging situation. Thank you, Thank you so much. <clears throat> And for bringing the international humanitarian law aspect uh, to this debate, which I think we might not always be thinking about, and then really uh, re-strengthening the resiliency of community and working as a collective. It is, is a mega challenge. It's, it's all of us in together. Monica, could I ask you the same question? My goodness, you have said all. <laughs> now I can throw my notes. It's good to have all in the same page. So I think I will go more for the really tiny things that we can do. We, we have been saying we need to work systemic, we need to make agreements, we need to speak out, but everything starts with a single step. And as you were saying, we are in, in, in areas where the population is highly vulnerable and we can learn from them which first step we need to take. So for, me, for, for, for us in MSF, what we are trying to do is learn. We have been late in a party, let's say that way, so for us, the first priority is get over this thing that we need to prove that there is an impact. We need to prove that there is a relationship. We just need to do things and we just need to witness and to speak out of what we see in the field without necessarily getting really into making links and, and proving stuff. We don't need to do that anymore. To do so, we need to educate ourselves. We are internally raising awareness, we are investing in trainings, we are investing in capacity building because you don't do what you don't know. And you don't look what you don't know what to look for. So I think that's the first step for us is, is really as humanitarian, as medical, as, as people committed to safe lives today, but not jeopardizing the future of tomorrow, see, be a little bit more educated. Once this is out of the way, then we, we, we need to as you were saying, and we, maybe we will develop later, how to mitigate our own, our own negative footprint. No? As, as, as a medical actor, and you mentioned uh, Steve, in MSF we have a charter and we abide by medical ethics. The first principle is do not harm. You cannot save a life today by putting that person in harm risk tomorrow. And, and, and that comes, what you were saying, is that we need to think thoughtfully on how we build our clinics, how we reach our communities and how we do it together because they will tell us what is the best mean to, to develop a humanitarian aid. And the last point I want to make is, and we cannot do it alone. We are a medical humanitarian organization, therefore, either anticipatory or reactive, most of the access are out of our scope and our expertise. So if we don't learn and we don't proactively look with others, we will never be able to strengthen our action. I don't want to repeat the, the health risk the population is, but I can see, say a couple of details that we are building up in what Chris was saying. In a much minor scale, we are doing research in a similar way, integrating weather and environmental aspects into our risk analysis. That's what we call integrating planetary health on the, on the context analysis and the health risk analysis that we are doing right now. So we have an operational research building up in, the, in historical data we have, adding the environmental factors in a period of time, and trying to see if we can come up with a predicted algorithm to see if we are expecting or not an extreme peak and when. 
And that will help us to go from, what you were saying, reacting to something in our face, to actually prevent that. And that comes again with a narrative for donors and other people supporting, saying that anticipatory action may not be visible, but at the end is what happens to have the biggest impact. Vaccine versus curing. If you don't prevent, you will need to cure. And it's not that you will not need to cure, and I agree with you. Immediate humanitarian action, not bound to development, peace building, and environmental factors is necessary. So sometimes we will not be eco-friendly, but that does not excuse us of not being it as many as we have, as much as we have. And in order, what you were saying, I, I really like that point of what a health structure can do for others. We had a very tiny but cute project in a refugee camp where we were, with the food uh, remainings, with the waste, we were building briquettes that the people could use as, as a fuel for cooking. So you do that circular, um, cir circular economy of, of, of things that, yeah, we are all integrated and we are all interlinked. So. Excellent. So now we've uh, heard some practical ideas. We've also heard that we need to do these things in collectives and we've also talked about um, the goals that we've set for ourselves. And you mentioned, uh, Catherine Loon, the, the uh, environmental and, and climate charter of the Red Cross um, and that everybody has to change because we're too small to make a difference, but we still have to walk the walk as organizations. Uh, and we still have to change ourselves. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, how the ICRC itself is uh, reducing its footprint and some of the challenges uh, that perhaps you're facing, given that we know that we're working in some of the most difficult environments where all the technologies, all the uh, um, ease of transport, et cetera, aren't going to be the first ones uh, to be climate smart or friendly. H how do we work in such environments and what are the challenges you're facing as you uh, go down that journey? Thank you, Stephen. I'd start by stressing, so when we develop the Climate and Environment Charter, the first commitment is about adapting our action, the second is about maximizing the environmental sustainability of our work. And there's a logic between behind that hierarchy, and that is that as humanitarian actors, we aim to respond to needs, and this remains the priority. Then, as we respond to needs, as you've been pointing out, and you've been pointing out, we strive to do no harm. And striving to do no harm does entail that we don't harm the environment in which we are working. So what the Charter says is that we will reduce our emissions, we will enhance sustainability while preserving our ability to deliver timely and principled humanitarian assistance. And this is important because, I mean, one of the elements that has come up when we speak of greening humanitarian action or reducing our footprint is precisely that. How will it hamper your operations? It is very clear that we can improve our ways of operating and preserve our capacity to operate. So we should not pit those two elements against one another. Now, concretely, what are we doing? So we committed as an institution to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% compared to 2018 levels by 2030, and this includes both direct and indirect emissions. We are working in that direction, notably through looking at um, our fleet, so transitioning into sustainable fleet. We are host to a Red Cross Red Crescent project that is looking into the environmental sustainability of our procurement and our logistics, which is basically looking at how do we reduce the footprint of our suppliers? How can we ask? And there the collective element becomes quite important, actually. As a humanitarian com community, we are heavy. I might not be heavy as a single organization, but as a humanitarian community, we do have some influence, notably on suppliers, because a part of our pollution comes from what we buy and what we transport to other parts of the world and so on. So that is part of some of the work that we are doing, engaging with suppliers to ask for greater, sorry, greater um, environmental sustainability, but also greater social um, considerations into the, the products that are um, being developed. We're also working, you were referring to waste. The two of you have spoken of waste. This is an area where we've been focusing quite a lot, looking at how do we better manage and reduce hazardous um, waste. So that's one of the areas of um, focus as well. 
Now a few examples of what that means on the reducing our footprints, um, on the reducing our carbon emissions uh, side of things. We're speaking of solar panels. I've alluded to the fleet of vehicles we're using. Um, these are some of the elements that are being looked into. The other thing that we're doing that connects with the collective um, dimension of the response is we developed for the ICRC a carbon accounting tool to be able to know what exactly we were emitting. This tool we are now adapting so it can be made available to the whole of the humanitarian system because this is something we've heard consistently. That is that we don't always have the required tools to be able to assess what we're doing and assess how we should be improving. Um, you've alluded to the challenges connected to this, and I'd like to speak to this for, for a second through highlighting four challenges that are applicable as well to adapting our programs to better capture climate and environmental risks. You've pointed this out. We do not, there's a technical challenge. We do not always have the know-how when it comes to integrating climate and environmental risks or even knowing where to get the right information to integrate into our programs. We can rely on partnerships to do a part of this, so getting experts to support us, but there's also an element, and you were pointing that out, there's an element of education inside our organizations that is extremely important. Then, Technical challenges also relate to the fact that there's not always an easy solution. Electric cars in a place where energy is not clean are probably not a good solution. So we need to take these elements into account and the solutions are not always that easy to find. Secondly, there is a challenge of pace. I think, and you've said it, you've said, well, it's fairly new for us to embrace this and we need to be humble and learn, which is true. But then on the other hand, we're pressed to do, to do this very fast because we're extremely late. We should have started a long time ago. So you don't have that much time ahead of you to change your practices, make sure that your programs meet people's needs and do not harm the environment and so on and so forth. So there's a tension there in terms of we don't have two decades ahead of us to learn. And this connects to the two other challenges I wanted to point out. I think there's a mindset challenge. We've now agreed that this is a humanitarian issue and this is progress. I don't think inside all organizations, it's yet fully agreed how much we should be invested and how much of a priority is this. And this connects to the resource challenge because there there's an element of, I mean, we're constantly as humanitarian organizations deciding where we invest, where we disinvest. And I don't think all of us, and that includes the ICRC, are yet fully comfortable with some of the investment that is required to do this at the right pace and in the right way. So quite a number of challenges, <laughs> I would say. I think if I can conclude on a positive sure. note, I think one thing that we do see is a willingness in organizations to change and we hear it from the staff. It's a very bottom up pressure to say, no, 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 we need to act because, because we are, are supporting this and we expect this from the organization and this I think is extremely positive and it's something that we need to build. I think that uh, those are very good challenges and a lot of that focuses around the utilitarian aspect of, of implementing climate friendly policies rather than just coming around from the other side on, on the general understanding. Uh, and, and you pointed this out earlier on our need to protect the environment and there's been a real tension in medical organizations that, that we're not environmentalists. And if we break things down a little bit to the social determinants of health, and this would be equivalent to all of you uh, in your practices, uh, if we don't have clean water, clean food, and clean air, then we're sick. It's as simple as that. And we forget that we're animals too. We like to think we're very smart animals, uh, but we're the ones that got ourselves into this problem. And so I think we do have to break it down into smaller pieces. Uh, we do see the bottom up. Uh, we have also the top-down challenge that many environmental, uh, many humanitarian organizations budget year over year, and the investments needed uh, have payback of three to five years in many cases. So there are a number of things that we need to do structurally, and I think that then requires leadership from people like me in our case, so I'm going to hopefully not take all the blame. Um, now I'm going to move over to you, though, uh, Monica, because you are leading this charge inside uh, MSF, and... Uh, Maybe you can answer the same question on, on our footprint and some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, well, again, we are in alignment. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, I think we, we, 
well, we are humanitarians, so therefore we are facing the same challenges and we have a similar mindset. I think the change of mindset, as you say, is the first and foremost thing that we need to, to say. This artificial conflict between saving lives and the environment needs to stop. We, you cannot save life destroying the environment. That, that's not going to work. So I think we need to, we are almost there, but still there is a little bit of uh, work to go over and jump to the other side and see that it's not that scary and we are not changing fundamentally who we are and becoming another organization. No? We, we just need to include that. So we are, as well as you were saying in MSF, we have um, committed to reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2030. And as you were saying, we, we signed the we signed the climate uh, the climate uh, I, I forgot an environment charter the climate charter yes. Um, but we, we so what we did and now I'm going to talk about MSF Switzerland. We finalized our carbon footprint based in 2019 data to try to understand where we can do the action that will have the biggest impact. And as you say, it's, it's not that surprising that supply is one of the things, the goods we buy and the way we move around is, is the things that have the biggest impact. So by doing that, it's important because once you know, you can measure and then you can be accountable. So that's a first and very important step. Then what we are doing is that's as a baseline, we are building our roadmap to see what what uh, actions we have to invest on to reduce our carbon footprint, but also to minimize our environmental uh, footprint and environmental negative impact. Um, as, a, as a movement as well, we have invested in a, in a transformational project that is the Climate Smart. It's, it's the same name that in Madagascar. We call it Climate Smart. And it's a little bit the same. It's, it's, uh, we, we brought out, uh, we brought in MSF talent that we didn't have insight in, in terms of uh, climate scientists and, and, and people knowing about the, the subject. And I really appreciate Sonia being part of that, uh, that initiative and, and supporting us. And is building up from tools for measuring carbon footprint and seeing how we automatize that and generalize in MSF to providing ready to use uh, projects on energy transition, for example, that people just go over the self, it's all written, you just need to implement it. Having seed funding for individual and small actions at field level that people want to do, but you know, you don't do it because you don't have that, that facility, that the only uh, string attached is that you need to measure how much carbon footprint you are saving. So by these little things, we can, we can learn and we can move faster. And, and then we are also acting. So while we are building the, the knowledge, while we are building our roadmap and measuring, we are already doing things. We are already starting the energy transition, big and small steps. We are better insulating our structures. We are using more solar for, for, our, uh, for our electricity, but as well we are changing and we are distributing solar pumps for water pumps. So when we are installing solar pumps in the community, uh, water pumps, now we are using solar. As you were saying, not all of the technology is adapted, so that's, that's also a challenge. Um, and I would like to go back to one of the things that uh, Steve uh, said in the beginning, because it's a pet project of the medical department, that is um, reducing plastic use. And uh, thanks to our uh, pharmacists uh, and our supply people, so we are starting a project right now to look for alternative materials for the plastic bags we use for delivering drugs. That is 20 million bags with 30 million plastic. So it's a lot of plastic that we could, if we find a proper, uh, a new material that is environmentally friendly, we can drastically reduce. On top of that, we, we are as well are using, are, are improving our waste. So 25% of our emissions in the last six months already have a safe waste plan, which is the first step to actually if not reducing, at least doing it more uh, responsibly. But at the same time, we are testing new things to reduce the ways we produce. Mostly, I'm sorry, I'm late. No, no. You're, you're <laughs> and, uh, and I think that the, the last thing I would like to, to say is that from the challenges, and I think you mentioned, we need to change our way of working. We need to change behavior. We need to learn and do individual action, but as well, we need 
as a humanitarian actor, the difficulty is finding a balance between immediate action, meaningful action, environmental emergency. And the way of finding that balance is to stop fighting each other. It has to be seen as a whole thing. So the, the, the assisting the populations today without not jeopardizing the future is our duty. So we have to find a, a, a way of not competing between investing in planetary friendly action and immediate action the old ways. I didn't want to interrupt your thought, but we have exactly four minutes left, and I think that would be perfect for just one decent Q&A question or two extremely short ones. So let's open it up, yep. if that's Did okay you with you. Or not? Sorry? Did you have something online or not? Um, no, we're going to take okay. it from the audience perfect. here. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and then uh, we can take it from here. Yes. Hi, this is Liz Willits from IISD. Thank you so much for this session. It's been very interesting. I have a question directed to our colleague from ICRC. Um, the international health regulations currently look at environmental emergencies only from the perspective of infectious disease. And I'm curious if you have comments on some of the proposals to open up the international health regulations to include climate change and other environmental emergencies. Am I allowed to call on my <laughs> director of health colleague in DHRC to answer this question? I think so. Michaela is sitting just there. She's the head of health programs at DHRC and is a better place to answer this question than me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just closer to the mic. Yeah, you need to speak right into the mic. Don't don't turn your head, or yeah. else it'll go out. So, so when it comes to international humanitarian law, I wonder if it's if it's just infectious disease. I don't have the idea that it's limited to infectious diseases. We're all speaking about wounded and sick, and I think that that is the concept. Maybe I'm I'm wrong in that. What what I do believe is that wounded and sick today might be uh, left leaving out those prevention actions like pregnant women that are not necessarily sick. So there is where we are looking into. But I um, so in that sense I don't think that it's only. Uh, confined to infectious diseases, but I don't think that it's that smart to be that clear when it comes to the climate risk. So it's something that uh, that could be uh, looked at. Wonderful. Yeah, I guess we have time for one quick question more. Right here, please. Hi, I'm Paul Atipoja from Health Policy Watch. Uh, my question is this, uh, you've described what you are doing individually as organizations. And um, what about your partners in countries where you are having these interventions? Are you trying to incorporate uh, this planetary health awareness uh, as a requirement or as one of the things that your partner or, or countries uh, should include? Uh, so I think uh, to be really accelerate uh, the kinds of changes that you want to quickly achieve. Thank you. That's Who an excellent question, and we'll go to Sonia to answer it. Okay, well, I'll answer quickly, but there is a lot of collaboration, and I'll just cite two. One is at the COP26 um, health program. There's 57 ministries of health who've signed up to make sure that their health systems are resilient and to decarbonize their health systems. And many, they're spread all over the world. And that coalition of countries is going to grow every week and every month. There's more countries that are joining and there is a huge momentum building there. Not everybody knows how they're going to do it. The other one is Race to Zero. There's a healthcare component to that. There's a humanitarian component to that where organizations can commit to reducing their carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and they need to be net zero by 2050. So there is a, the race is on, everybody's joining and the key message is that we all need to finish the race together. No point in one person getting there and not the others. I'll Excellent. Leave it there. Thank you so much and thank you to all of you. Big applause.